Good day, good uh, afternoon, good evening, good morning to everyone. Uh, as Vincent told you, I am the chairman of CCRI Section 2. Uh, Section 2 is specifically focused on radioactivity measurements or radionuclide metrology. Those of you who are not familiar with the uh, CC structure, uh, the consultative committees and ionizing radiation is one of them, uh, are advisory to the BIPM and for international metrology in various fields. In CCRI, uh, Consultative Committee on Ionizing Radiation, we focus on ionizing radiation measurements, including uh, dosimetry, neutron measurements, and for our purposes today, radioactivity. I would also like to send a special welcome to our colleagues from CCQM, which are the which is the consultative committee for for chemistry in essence. Uh, and uh, as Vincent said, we have a couple of representatives from CCQM as co-panelists on in this webinar. So how did we get the, here? Uh, I've got to move people to the side here. Uh, those of you who come from radioactivity measurements are quite aware that we've had for many, many decades wonderful technologies and techniques for measuring radioactive decay. That's been great. For those of you who are coming to us from the chemistry side of the shop, and although I'm in ionizing radiation, my education is actually in chemistry, you haven't so much counted decays as counted material or atoms or molecules. I know you don't think of it so much in terms of counting, but in, you go about the metrology in looking at the components of things. So how, so early on, early on in this uh, millennium, we in the radio, radionuclide metrology community started talking about, well, how can we use some techniques from chemistry, such as mass spectrometry, in our metrology for measuring radioactive decay? There are many potential applications for this, uh, especially when it comes to such samples as you would get out of environmental, uh, from environmental sources for nuclear forensics, environmental measurements, reference materials. You can also get a lot of information by mass spec in decay and determining certain decay data, such as half-life. When something has such a long half-life, it is difficult to count for an entire half-life. Using something such as mass spec helps give us more data. Back in 2015, at a CCRI uh, Section 2 meeting, we had a presentation on something called single atom counting. Single atom counting, as the name implies, is the idea of counting atom by atom. Again, in radioactivity, we count decays, and the probability is that a decay is coming from an atom. Now, if you, have a, if you know how many atoms you have, each one will have a probability of decaying, and how do we kind of join these two bits of information in order to get a valid uh, value and its uncertainties. And so it became clear that there was a joint interest between Section 2 of CCRI and CCQM, specifically the Inorganic Analysis Working Group, to further pursue this idea. And in early, uh, last year, in the 2021 CCRI Section 2 meeting, we introduced this concept. So as you can imagine, there are many challenges. Um, not every NMI or DI, National Measurement Institute or Designated Institute, will have both mass spec and counting methods for radioactivity in the same shop, because most people with mass spectrometry don't want to put, do not want to put radioactive materials in their machines. You need to choose the right instrument, you need to know the right matrices you're looking at. Should you look, should you start with something very simple, such as water, or should you go to something more complicated, such as ground up building materials? Picking the right radionuclides is also important. Mass spec is a wonderful tool, but it is not appropriate for many uh, radioactive 
species for various and sundry reasons. And of course, the big problem is trying to relate the mass information you get from mass spectrometry to the results you get from counting methods in radionuclide metrology. After this webinar, we're hoping to continue the discussion. I look forward to having a joint workshop, probably virtually, later this year, where we can discuss some of the needs, challenges, and the advances of using mass spec in radionuclide metrology applications. So again, our speakers are Richard Essex from NIST, who will talk about the complementary measurements of radioactive materials, mass spec, counting methods. Ben Russell is joining us from the NPL in the UK. He will talk about some of the reference materials that need to be developed in order to make this connection uh, viable. And we will end up with Dirk Arnold from the PTB. He will talk to us about a brand new European project, which includes using mass spec in radioactivity measurements. And so with that, I am going to stop my share. And Richard, you're up. All right, uh, give me a moment to bring up uh, my slides. Okay, uh, uh, everyone can hear me and, and see see my slides? Looks perfect, Richard, thank you. <clears throat> All right, great. So, so a couple months back when, when Lisa asked me to, to give, present, uh, I, I guess uh, she, she, she'd asked for some, some sort of background or intro uh, to this issue of uh, mass spectrometry and radionuclide metrology. And, and, and frankly, I sort of, uh, uh, um, didn't exactly have a great sense of the audience and, and basically chose to uh, do something that that's uh, sort of a very basic introduction to mass spectrometry, specifically mass spectrometry that I think is most relevant to radionuclide metrology. And, and for many of you, this might be insultingly uh, <laughs> simplistic, but uh, on the other hand, you know, my, my own experience is, is somewhat uh, uh, interesting in that for many years, I worked at New Brunswick Laboratory in the Department of Energy, where we had a series of mass spectrometers, but only had a couple of banks of alpha spec, and that was our entire counting capability. And then I moved to the radioactivity division at the National Institute of Standards and Technology, where we have very limited mass spectrometry capability, but a lot of counting capability. And, and, and in both places, I think there are some misconceptions about what can be done with one method relative to the other. Although, I think everybody was aware about some of the complementary natures. So I'm going to sort of quick, hopefully quickly talk a little bit about what you know I mean when I'm saying mass spectrometry or when we're talking about mass spectrometry before getting into some actual examples of the kinds of uh, complementary aspects I'm uh, talking about. I guess, first of all, when I was producing this talk, I thought, let me go and get the IUPAC definitions of mass spectrometry and mass spectrum. And I found they were very inclusive, but not very informative. So I went to Wikipedia instead and, and found some, uh, I think, definitions that maybe aren't so inclusive, but are a little bit more informative. And, 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 and I think maybe many of you know, but I'll sort of state anyway, that, that mass spectrometry is a technique that's used to measure the mass to charge ratio of ions. I think more accurately, it's used to produce spectra based on the mass to charge ratio of ions. That's, that's really what we're looking at. And, and then, you know, to, to sort of further the definition, what do we mean by a mass spectrum? And the part that I've highlighted here is, is really the key part. And that's the, the spectra we produce are used to determine the elemental and isotopic signatures of a sample, uh, the masses of atoms and of molecules, and to elucidate the chemical, identity and structure of molecules and other chemical compounds. And the reason I've underlined this is that, you know, for, for the kind of work, I think the kind of measurements made for, for radionuclide metrology, um, you're looking for primarily at, at isotopics compositions or elemental compositions, but the vast majority of mass spectrometry that goes on in the world really has to do, is probably geared towards um, organic uh, chemistry, me measuring the, the compositions of organic molecules and, and, and DNA and, and uh, uh, um, compounds like that. And, and 
So, you know, given the world that I'm in, I usually don't think of that, but the truth is probably the vast majority of mass spectrometers and types of mass spectrometers are not really appropriate for the work that we do. Um, so uh, I, I just put up a couple examples of mass spectra here. You know, this is the top one is what you would typically see from something like a uh, um, uh, mass spectrometer that's been optimized for measuring isotopic composition. Um, what on the lower level is probably what somebody, an organic chemist would sort of recognize as um, a spectra that, that that's sort of showing the various components of some uh, organic molecule that's been broken up and ionized and, and they have characteristic distributions of masses rather than characteristic masses. But we're for the most part not interested in these kind of spectra. It's more these type that are of interest to us. So I realize this is very basic, but uh, I want to talk about the types of mass spectrometers, and mass spectrometry that we're really interested in. And, and to do that, we sort of need to talk about mass spectrometers in general a little bit, because the types are generally defined by two things, uh, what type of ion source they have and what type of mass analyzer they have. Um, all mass spectrometers are basically composed of five components or some combination of these components. Of course, there's the sample introduction system. How do you get a sample in? Sometimes that's very simple. You open a door and you stick in the samples. Uh, um, <clears throat> other times it can be much more complicated where you're running samples through a gas chromatograph before it's injected into a sample. But the ion source is where your solid, your gas, uh, your, your uh, uh, liquid is, uh, turned into ions, which are then collimated and accelerated to your mass analyzer, which can be a magnet or a quadrupole electric static filter. And then of course, after the, the, uh, the, the ions ha have been um, segregated by their masses, you need to detect them somehow. I mean, in, in the beginning, your detector system and your data recorder were the same thing. Those were mass spectrographs where you're essentially recording the spectra on, on a, um, photographic film, but now there's a bunch of other detectors, uh, secondary electron multipliers, uh, daily detectors, um, and, and uh, Faraday cups are, are the, probably the most common. Um, so <clears throat> there's probably 30 or 40, if not more, different types of mass spectrometers, and, and, and many times they're different sort of uh, collections of, uh, of ion sources and analyzers and detectors. Uh, the ones I've highlighted in green on this slide are the ones that are probably most relevant for radionuclide metrology. Uh, for very low abundance kinds of isotopes, accelerator mass spectrometry is, is uh, a method that's sometimes used. For uh, radioactive gases, gas source mass spectrometry, you know, xenon, krypton from, from uh, radioactive materials might be analyzed this way. Um, inductively, coupled plasma mass spectrometry is really talking about the, the, the ion source and how you're ionizing. These, uh, this is a very important type of uh, measurement uh, equipment because um, inductively coupled plasma mass spectrometry can ionize, successfully ionize or relatively efficiently most of the periodic table. And they're very commonly used in mass spectrometers used to measure elemental composition and also to do high precision um, isotopic ratio type measurements. Uh, the old sort of workhorse used to be thermal ionization mass spectrometry, and that was primarily almost exclusively for isotopic ratio measurements. Um, the analyzers, the quadrupole and the magnetic sector, uh, again, these are probably quite uh, probably the more common types for the kind of work we're looking to do. Uh, magnetic sector for isotopic ratio type measurements uh, and sometimes for elemental measurements and quadrupole very common for elemental and uh, other type measurements. I've highlighted a penning trap down here. Uh, the, the, uh, <clears throat> the penning ion trap measurements are very, um, very, very sensitive techniques for very high resolution measurements of the masses of, uh, of ions. And, and they're actually, when you look at like the uh, atomic mass evaluations that are published, many of the masses in that publication are, are measured by these penning traps. And 
this is of interest to the radionuclide community because you know the the differences between mo mother and daughter or, or uh, parent and daughter radionuclides uh, are used to uh, the mass differences are used to determine Q values and penning traps are, <clears throat> as I mentioned. Uh, one of the ways, or probably the most common way of getting these high, very high resolution mass measurements. Of course, these are not going to be used in everyday metrology, but I thought I'd mention them all the same. Um, so what's the, the complementary nature of mass spectrometry and radionuclide metrology? Of course, I, I mentioned the nuclide masses, but also the relative abundance of radionuclides of the same element uh, and of different elements. The, uh, mass spectrometry, as Lisa mentioned, is a good way of getting at absolute abundances uh, where you don't have to be dependent on half-life. Um, also, these can be very important for identifying um, rad contamination in your mass spectrometry samples, but also uh, long-lived contaminants or, or uh, sort of contaminants with coincident energy, energies in your um, radioactive uh, measurement samples. And of course, if you're interested in what other materials are in there, perhaps non-radioactive mass spectrometry is a good way to get it. And then there's the, the interferences on both sides, both in uh, radioactivity measurements and in mass measurements. Um, these methods can help to alleviate those. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in the later slides. But first I wanna give some sort of concrete examples of, of how uh, um, mass spectrometry and radionuclide metrology can, can uh, uh, <clears throat> work together. Uh, a good example are half-life measurements. Um, uh, again, this may be obvious to many, but I'll sort of give a couple examples of, of how uh, mass spectrometry is used in this. Um, this is just an example that this has been done by, by several workers, but it, for example, Cheng et al. in 2000, um, made some new determinations of the 234 uranium and 230 uh, thorium half-lives by taking samples that they believed to, you know, they'd been closed systems for millions of years, believed to be in secular equilibrium, and using the known half-life of 238 and then measuring the uh, atom ratios of 238 and 234 and 230, you could calculate the half-lives based on the fact that you believe them to be in secular equilibrium, and you have a known half-life for 238. Um, <clears throat> another method is using um, mass spectrometry to relatively accurately and precisely determine the amount of material and something that you've been able to perform accurate radioactivity uh, counting measurements on. Um, there's a few examples that, that I sort of cite in parentheses here, but I'm going to talk a little bit about some work that we, was done uh, at, at NIST in collaboration with uh, some of the Department of Energy Laboratories and CEA in France. And for this, we took uh, some very carefully measured thorium-229 that, that was prepared at NIST and then measured uh, the uh, uh, concentration of these, these calibrated solutions very carefully. And we used isotope pollution mass spectrometry to do this work. And, and I wanna sort of point out the capabilities here is that by carefully preparing spikes and samples, we were able to get uh, these blue dots here on this chart represent uh, a bunch of separate measurements of the amount of thorium-229 in this material. Now, the relative standard deviation on these measurements is, is 0.08%, which is you know, pretty, pretty good uh, uh, repeatability. But the thing to keep that you don't know, but I'm gonna point out here is that this represents um, at least half a dozen different ampules of sample. The mass spectrometry measurements were made by three different laboratories um, and three different preparations of a thorium-232 spike were used to make these measurements. So despite, and, and actually some of these measurements were separated by as much as two years. So despite a, a lot of potential for, for variability, you can get very precise results and repeatable results using isotope pollution mass spectrometry if you're careful with your work. I guess that's true for all measurements. Um, an, an example of, sort of how uh, using mass spectrometry to measure impurities. Um, there's a couple of different examples I've cited here. 
Um, again, I'm going back to some work that we've done, not that we've done, but that was sort of of particular interest to me. In um, 2011, uh, Kukunaga et al. measured uh, the half-life of thorium-229, but they did it in sort of an interesting way. Uh, they used the activity ratios of a purified 233 uranium and 232 uranium mix, and then the activity ratios of ingrown thorium-229 and thorium-228, and then knowing the half-lives of, of three of these were, were determined what the half-life of thorium-229 is. Uh, now, the impurity measurements were they needed to correct their uranium data for uh, any uh, their activity measurements for any interferences from other uranium isotopes. So they used mass spectrometry for that. But one of the things I noted is this exact measurement, a parallel measurement could have been done by measuring the 233-232 ratio on an atom level, and then the thorium-229-228 on an atom level. And then the same calculate, a similar calculation could have been done using the half-lives of the other materials. Um, <clears throat> Now, this is the second example I want to talk about is one where uh, actually mass spectrometry wasn't used, but it's a good example of how it could enhance things. Um, the thorium-229 that I've been talking about for the last couple slides is actually an SRM from NIST uh, that was very carefully uh, calibrated by, and described in Fitzgerald et al. in 2010. The single largest component of the uncertainty budget for that, if you took a, and split out all the components, was the inter, interference from the thorium-228 uh, that was in this material. And, and they measured an activity ratio of 0 0.17 plus or minus 0 0.02, about 12%. They used gamma spec and alpha spec to get this activity ratio. Um, <clears throat> that was... As I mentioned, that's the largest single contributor to the uncertainty. Well, if you looked at an atom ratio based on, on the half-lives, you're looking at something about four times 10 to the minus six uh, ratio of 228 to, to, to 229 thorium. Now, for um, like a multi-collector mass spectrometer, uh, and if you planned your measurement to try to measure this ratio carefully, it, you could potentially measure it to one to 2% expanded uncertainty. Uh, and if you then you use that <clears throat> use that in half lives, you could improve your uh, resulting uncertainty for the entire measurement of that um, uh, the uh, activity of that thorium two twenty nine would drop from uh, a combined standard uncertainty of about point three percent to point two three percent, almost a twenty five percent reduction just by being able to carefully make this ratio measurement. So. I just sort of point this example as, as a way in which mass spectrometry can uh, can um, be very complementary to activity measurements for things like e even standards. Um, I just won't spend much time on this slide. This was just an example that uh, this is a ratio of 233 uranium to 238 uranium that was about 10 times lower than what we would have needed to measure for the thorium. And we got to one to 2% uncertainty without uh, too much difficulty. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, very quickly, I, I think there's some classic examples of how uh, um, mass spectrometry and radioactivity measurements can be are complementary. You know, my experience is frequently with the actinides, and plutonium is sort of a classic example. Um, many times when we want to determine, carefully determine the 238 plutonium composition in a material of plutonium, we had to perform alpha spec because there was always a fairly significant 238U interference that we couldn't sort of differentiate. Um, likewise, uh, when measuring um, plutonium, we always had to do very careful separations and then fairly soon after those separations, measure the plutonium so that we weren't getting this interference from Amaris in 241. A lot of laboratories to get sort of not the most precise, but, but uh, good numbers would do uh, gamma spec to determine how much 241 americium is in their plutonium. And then of course, there's sort of the famous case of the inability, because of their close energies, the inability to resolve the, the alpha decays of 239 plutonium and 240 plutonium, where mass spectrometry has no problem with that. 
There's other examples such as measuring uranium-232. Again, mass spectrometry has the problem of, of, of the 232 thorium interference. And of course, there's uh, uh, contaminants in, in, in bulk counting methods that can be determined by uh, mass spectrometry. So to finish up, not to take too much more time, um, you know, I, I think it's clear to everybody that measuring radioactivity and measurements by mass spectrometry are fundamentally different. And the one is measuring emissions uh, and the other is measuring essentially the spectra created by the mass to charge ratios. So one's measuring uh, the, the energy or particles coming out in emissions, and the other's literally measuring the material itself. Um, and as I think Lisa touched on, due to these fundamentally different natures, there's frequently limited institutional overlap for these kinds of measurements, which I think is, is uh, unfortunate because these disciplines are, are so complementary to one another including uh, higher precision mass spectrometry and radioactivity measurements and isotopic composition measurements, things like half-lives. And, and I think there's even opportunities for, for uh, better understanding of branching ratios where mass spectrometry and counting methods can really help each other. So I, I hope this wasn't too basic, but I, I thought it might be a good way to start off. And some of our other speakers are gonna talk in, in more detail, I think about some of these things. So I'll stop sharing now. Thank you very much, Richard. As a reminder, if you have any questions for our speakers, please put them into the Q&A um, box. Uh, we'll hold questions to the end of the webinar, if that's all right. And so our next speaker is Ben. Ben, there you are. Uh, so Ben Russell comes to us from the NPL in the UK. Ben, take it away. Thank you very much uh, indeed. So hopefully that, is that sharing okay? Yes, it looks good. Great, thank you very much. Um, yes, hello everyone. Thank you very much for, for attending this and thank you to everyone involved in the organization of this um, of this meeting. It's a real sort of pleasure to be here. And I think uh, Richard has set the scene very nicely indeed for, for this. And um, yeah, my name's Ben Russell, I work in the nuclear metrology group at the National Physical Laboratory and my main technical role is running the, the mass spectrometry facility that we have there. Uh, so I think for the next bit of time I'll follow on from what Richard was saying. We used, the work we've done at NPL is a, a bit of a case study initially to talk about um, for how long we've had the capability, what it is we have and how we used it um, to advance uh, the advanced radionuclide metrology in our lab. Um, and then we'll have a, a bit of a look at more generally about what the requirements are for developing um, mass spectrometry relevant reference materials specifically for the radionuclide measurement. So for context, that's a photo of our laboratory here. So we have a tandem or triple quad uh, ICPMS instrument, and we've had that for around six years now. Uh, prior to this, we didn't have any mass spectrometry capability at all. This was our first venture into this area, uh, and the remit for when the lab was first set up was to look at measurement of sort of mid and long lived radionuclides as an alternative, and indeed, as we'll go on to say, a, a support for the K counting techniques. and also to look at potentially expanding the number of radionuclides that could be measured compared to when we didn't have mass spectrometry capabilities in the lab. MPL got this capability because of um, a trend that was, has been mentioned by Lisa and again by Richard uh, earlier on, which is the sort of increasing use of mass spectrometry for radionuclide measurements. And it was seen as a need for, for the nuclear metrology group to have this sort of capability to help underpin some of the standards and methods that, that they have. So I'll explain a bit more about this second to last point shortly, but the, the, there's a range of different instrument designs all with their sort of advantages and potential limitations, as I'm sure is familiar to, to everyone on this call. But the choice out of the, all the instrument designs for tandem mass spectrometry was to 
use the integrated reaction cell and additional quadrupole mass filter for enhanced interference removal and to support or in some cases replace uh, offline chemical separation techniques. Uh, as I go on to say, no, no instrument is sort of perfect. So um, that is one area that's of interest indeed for development of standards and reference materials is the comparison between instruments themselves. Uh, but then the aim was to develop new projects, um, measurement services and provision of standards, which is in a way what this next slide is, is trying to show. So, uh, so there's a number of standards of radionuclides at MPL. And as part of having mass spectrometry capability, we looked at two parts really. One was the re-measurement of existing standards for, I've mentioned here, induct a couple plasma mass spectrometry related impurities. In fact, it's, it is that, but also, uh, as has been mentioned, impurities that perhaps are, are very challenging to pick up using uh, using radiometric techniques. So that was one area why we were looking to do that. We then also looked at the spiking of um, some of the existing standards where we had uh, interferences that were relevant to mass spectrometry measurement. So for example, here we've worked in the past with strontium-90, where we looked at the addition of a stable zirconium-90 based interference. Um, as familiar to many MPL run uh, environmental proficiency test exercise where um, what we've noticed is where the participants uh, take part in this and complete the uh, information for how they measured radionuclides for long-lived nuclides in particular what we found is there's an increasing number of participants that are reporting the use of mass spectrometry for long-lived radionuclides and as a result of that the what is included in the PTE and the activity levels that are included have to adapt uh, to be able to reflect that. And that in turn goes into the uh, demand for what standards we need to, to develop and standardize. So we also use it, um, as mentioned, as part of checking the dilution and uh, also the homogeneity for long lived radionuclides as well. So I we we'll spend too much time on this. The, the point I suppose I'd like to make is in relation to, the, to developing standards and reference materials is that there's a range of applications where mass spectrometry can contribute. So uh, Rich has already mentioned uh, actinides uh, with some nice examples. Uh, I've turned them medium lived radionuclides, not the most quantitative term, but things on the order of tens or hundreds of years or 1,600 years in the case of radium-226. Um, isotopic ratios is a very interesting area. This is where perhaps you can expand the number of radionuclides measurable. So I've mentioned example there, um, so cesium-135, a very long-lived uh, radioactive isotope of cesium, which along with the cesium-137 uh, measured a ratio between the two. It can be a, quite a powerful forensic tool for determining the source of contamination. The long-lived low abundance radionuclides that perhaps of interest for longer term waste monitoring. Again, the long half-life in theory lends itself well to mass spectrometry. And I've mentioned at the bottom there radionuclide standards already. Uh, material characterization refers to things like resin, resin materials and characterization of uh, how effective the separation is for those. And it's mentioned one area of MPL that's of sort of increasing interest is in the nuclear medicine area. Now, as has been mentioned, uh, the, the half-life has a big impact here and the very short half-life of medical radionuclides is, is not feasible for mass spectrometry measurement. But what I mentioned there is looking at uh, using stable analogs for method development prior to doing active trials. And this is by no means an exhaustive list. It's just uh, some examples of radionuclides that we've been asked about um, in relation to mass spectrometry measurement uh, over the last few years. And you see that there's a range of half-lives, range from just over 10 years up to billions of years. Um, and there was, there's some that where we didn't have a, perhaps as good a result as we were hoping at this stage, or that we weren't able to get a working method in place just yet. And that was some case due to significant 
uh, interferences that were in place. Uh, in some cases, it was due to provision of the starting material itself. But just again, this is not an exhaustive list. It's just to give an idea of the range of radionuclides where uh, mass spectrometry has potentially got a role to play and where uh, there has been interest from from um, from external customers and collaborators to look into this. Uh, I won't spend too long here because Richard has covered it nicely already with to cover that there's a range of different instrument designs that um, where we, when it comes to mass spectrometry and the part to take away, I've mentioned instrument design is also differences as I'm sure will be familiar to many people in how the sample is introduced and with those different setups, there's differences in the sensitivity of the instrument, the precision of isotopic ratios, if that's been done, the extent of interference removal and how much uh, sample preparation is required prior to measurement, um, the um, instrumental mass bias, and I'm sure a number of other factors as well. And again, the development of standards and reference materials uh, have to factor in that this sort of bridging the uh, improving the understanding between the advantages and limitations of different instrument types to reflect the range that, that different laboratories have. So this is probably to summarize this at this stage where it's all up to. So we've had this increasing use of mass spectrometry for radionuclide measurement that is supported by um, sort of new standards bodies. So there's a sort of ISO committee that as a working group on mass spectrometry measurement for, for radionuclide detection. And um, Dirk will be speaking soon about where that's been recognized from a European metrology program level with the successful bid for a project that, that these talks and this, um, this webinar relates to. And there's a, an opportunity for comparison with decay counting techniques. And indeed, as I mentioned in the last slide, between different mass spectrometry designs. and there is a need to develop and evolve standards and reference materials in order to reflect this. The top graph there is an example of some work that was done on cesium-135-137 isotopic ratios. And it shows the uh, how the difference in ratio varies depending on the source of contamination or even between different reactors. This is from different parts of the Fukushima reactor following the accident there. 10 years ago, and the show that cesium-135 is very well suited. Half-life is uh, just over 2 million years, and that lends itself well to mass spectrometry measurement, and that enables the measurement of isotopic ratios such as this. Um, short term, of course, cesium-134, 137 ratio can be used, but the cesium-134 has a half-life of just over two years, so it's not a long-term option. Uh, Richard mentioned the application for uh, atom counting for long half-life measurements. This is a graph that a PhD student, Emma Brasher, put together recently. And it's sort of the cumulative uh, number of uh, publications where mass spectrometry has been used um, uh, to contribute to half-life measurements. And you can see that that's sort of on a, an upward trend and potentially not every paper was caught as a part of that, but you can see the direction in which that, that is going. So just a quick definition of reference materials and certified reference materials there, but um, the only thing to comment on is that there are, of course, mass spectrometry and radioactivity based reference materials and certified reference materials. There's some providers there, of course, others that I, that I haven't mentioned there. However, reference materials that cover the amount or the, the mass concentration of material and the activity concentration are rare. However, as was familiar to many of you, the two are, of course, related. So there is potentially a link to be made there. Um, but just some consideration of some of the challenges that come with characterizing reference materials in terms of both activity and mass. Um, so this has been mentioned already, and indeed, um, many of us come to the MPL conference on applied radiation metrology would have seen um, Richard gave a very detailed presentation on exactly this topic uh, a couple of years ago. But some of the factors and 
be interested and may of course be the others that I haven't considered but um, of course what is being measured is different as Lisa points out at the beginning the activity concentration uh, compared to measuring the amount or perhaps the isotopic ratios. We might have to consider when preparing them the difference in the interferences that have to be considered. So an example is given there for uh, our spectrometry for I mean, plutonium 239 and 240 combined because of similar emission energies. Whereas that of course can be measured, you can measure the isotopic ratio of those two using mass spectrometry. Um, by comparison, we have to consider the presence of isobaric, polyatomic and tailing interferences of looking at mass spectrometry relevant materials. Um, the purity of the material, again, links perhaps to the interferences, but in terms of the preparation of the samples and how they're processed, is that going to cause contamination issues that differ between um, the, depending on what it is that you're looking to measure and what technique you'll be using and the use of Things like carriers and stabilised types that can introduce interferences. There are some standards we have here that have uh, a very high concentration of stable carrier of an isotope of the same element as uh, as what we are preparing the standard for. For example, a strontium-90 standard with a very high strontium-88 concentration as a carrier that potentially prevents or limits its use as a, as a mass spectrometry standard. And... Uh, of course, the, there's a big range of radionuclides of interest, as I've alluded to, but there's, depending on activity or mass measurement, there are a range of half-lives that can be measured and some of which are, are not feasible by mass spectrometry. Um, and depending on the activity or mass measurement, there might be difference in the activities and the amount of material that is required. Um, it's not to say, of course, there aren't mass spectrometry relevant reference materials, uh, particularly for stable elements, and also, uh, as been mentioned already, covering uh, the actinides as well. But there is certainly a need to continue to develop such materials um, to reflect the increasing use of this technique and the increasing number of radionuclides that can be measured. So this is our final slide for the, the summary part, but just to say that uh, just a few sort of ideas really um so uh, looking at existing materials that perhaps have been characterized for um, the activity concentration is the, the potential to look at mass spectrometry relevant radionuclides in those materials uh, depending on the uh, project this is something that richard has spoke to me about before um is that potentially there are enriched and high purity isotopes available depending on the project that is of interest and can potentially be measured for the concentration and for the isotopic composition. And going forward, and the Dirk will speak about this, there's the potential to look at reference materials certified from both the decay counting and from a mass spectrometry point of view. And um, perhaps two key things to, to factor in are, let's see, the, what the materials itself, of course, and what is of, of interest, as Lisa has mentioned, something simple like water or a more complex material. And what radionuclides are perhaps priority or uh, can be potentially measured by both decay counting and mass spectrometry techniques. And what application area is being covered, perhaps nuclear decommissioning, um, isotopic ratios for forensic applications and um, or perhaps environmental samples. Uh, and indeed, there may be others as well. The table there just shows uh, an ex uh, a few recent examples from Richard again and his, his colleagues where uh, mass spectrometry was used for in combination with or independently uh, of activity measurements for characterization of several um, enriched um, sorry, isotopic standards of several elements, protactinium, uranium and plutonium based standards. So. Just a, a summary slide, the shows a mass spectrometry is increasingly being used for radionuclide measurement. And you see an expansion in the number of radionuclides that are measurable compared to decay counting techniques alone. And the development of uh, reference materials for radionuclides relevant to mass spectrometry uh, offers some sort of quite exciting opportunities for further investigating the, the links between decay counting and mass spectrometry techniques. 
um, an ability to report on the advantages and limitations of different instrument designs, and um, also ultimately to provide as much as possible traceability and underpinning of methods that have demonstrated the increasing use of a number of radionuclides measured using this approach. Um, but then, I mean, that's just uh, some references that were mentioned as part of this talk, which um, I believe we've made available after this. And that was everything from me. Just so say thank you very much again for the opportunity to present and for attending. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. Very interesting. We do have one question that is a clarification on your presentation. So um, Mark Keller from the LNHB in France was asking if those half-life measurements uh, using mass spectrometry that you showed on one of your earlier slides, uh, were the, was that actually done at the NPL or are those the evaluated or, and recommended values? Oh no, I wish they were all ones that we'd measured, but no, they were from the recommended values instead. Sorry, yeah, that's a good, good question. Great, thank you. And thanks, Mark, for uh, asking that. Mm. So Simon says hi. In any case, um, thank you very much again, Ben. Uh, Dirk, uh, we're up to you. Yeah, thank you. I'll try to share my screen. You are sharing. Yes. And um, you are presenting. Thank you. It's the presenter mode, right? OK. Dear colleagues, it's a pleasure for me to present you the planned work in the upcoming project metrology for the harmonization of measurements of environmental pollutants in Europe. This project was selected for funding from the Green Deal Call 2021 of the European Partnership on Metrology Research Funding Program. And it will start in summer 2022 for the duration of three years. If you are interested in more details of the research program, please have a look to this um, web page. So our consortium consists out of uh, 12 NMIDIs, uh, which are shown here, and uh, 10 university and research institutes that are in the lower part of this uh, site. So, I already mentioned that our project is related to the European Green Deal. The European Green Deal has eight elements. These are this in green here. Um, one of these is the zero pollution ambition for a toxic free environment. And that is a point, is a connecting point for our project. And more details about the European Green Deal can be found in this document. Uh, which was published at the end of uh, 2019. I think it is pretty clear to reach a zero pollution, um, one needs reliable and sensitive pollution monitoring systems. But pollution monitoring is not new. Let's have a look to some of the existing regulation and monitoring programs. One of the oldest regulation on European level is a treaty established establishing the European Atomic Energy Community from March 1957, which is relevant for the mon um, monitoring of radioactive pollutants as required in this Article 35, where it is given, each member state shall establish the facilities necessary to carry out continuous monitoring of the level of radioactivity in air, water and soil and to ensure compliance with the basic standards. And there are several other European regulations uh, that are relevant for both the monitoring of radioactive pollutants as well as for the monitoring of stable isotope pollutants. But why do we need our, our project uh, when everything is already regulated? So let's have a look to the data from um, the measurement concerning was relevant for, uh, to this Article 35. And this paper published in uh, May 2019 is a report about 30 years of the European Commission Radioactivity Environmental Monitoring Data Bank. On the one hand side, there are more than 5 million data sets are available in this data bank. 
But on the other hand, there's a following statement in the publication. Artificial alpha enabling aerosols are rarely measured by routine monitoring networks as they are usually undetectable, even close to the nuclear installations where they are produced. For radioactive pollutants, especially alpha and particle emitting radionuclides, this is the point where our project comes into the field. I think I have demonstrated that the zero pollution ambition promoted by the European Green Deal requires highly sensitive and state-of-the-art detection techniques for the measurement of ultra-low amount of pollutants. As a part of the picture, you can see the stable pollutants here, as well as the uh, radioactive pollutants, which are in the focus of our project. For radioactive pollutants in the environment, the state-of-the-art measurement technique are based on the counting of decay products, but to measure low activities of radionuclides, very long measurement times are required, and the measurement uncertainties are dominated by the low counting statistics. For radionuclides with long half-lives like uranium and plutonium, the way out is to measure the existing atoms and not the, de the decaying atoms, and that means to use mass spectrometry as a key method with a high potential for reducing measurement uncertainties and detection limits. But there is no existing traceability chain for radioactive elements, and there is a lack of SI traceable reference materials for stable isotopes. One central question is, how can we measure the activity of radionuclides with mass spectrometry, or how are the two SI units, the mole and the second, linked with each other. The link from the second to the becquerel as a derived quantity is obviously. And the amount of substance for a radionuclide is connected with the activity by this equation. That means by measuring the amount of substance by mass spectrometry, we can determine the activity of a radioisotope. And as I already said, for long lift radionuclides like uranium-238 and plutonium-40, it is clear that the activities in the order of uh, around one millibecquerel milli can be better measured by mass spectrometry. But now is, it is time to have a closer look to the work plan of our project. We have structured our work in four scientific work packages, supplemented by an impact work package and the management and coordination work package. On the left hand side, you can see work package one and work package three focusing on the radioactive pollutants. And on the right hand side, the stable isotopes covered in work package two and work package four. In work package one and two, the same kind of mass spectrometry systems are used and work package three and four will use the same seawater sample as raw material for the reference materials. Let's have a look to the different kind of mass spectrometry systems in our project. And as you can see, it is an advantage of a large consortium with 22 partners is that we can include a large variety of different system in our research project. And they are both used in the, for the stable and for the radionuclides um, measured in our project. So let us first have a deeper look to the work package one and work package three. We will prepare traceable aqueous standards containing radionuclides radioactive pollutants, uranium, neptunium, plutonium, americium, strontium, radium. We will establish the advantages and limitation of commercially available instruments in decay counting techniques. And we will produce recommendations for low-level radionuclide measurements using mass spectrometry. We also will have two radioactive reference materials, liquid and solid, containing these radioactive pollutants for the use in two interlaboratory comparisons. And uh, so let me summarize the plant major outputs. So the major outputs are 
traceable aqueous radioactive standards for single, for mixed, uh, um, and for also for isotope, isotopic ratio standards. We will have two reference materials and we will have a guide on the use of mass spectrometry for level, low level radionuclide detection, including detection limits and uncertainty budgets. Just a few words con uh, concerning the uncertainties. With radiometric methods, the, uncertain the uncertainties for the measurement of radioactive pollutants in the environment are in the order of 1% to a few percent in the case that we have no, not a significant contribution from the count in statistics. So that same range would be also good for um, uh, the mass spectrometry measurements. I think this hint is very important because for stable isotopes, we are dealing with much smaller uncertainties. And that is the point where I'm now switching to the stable isotope part of our project. And um, I have already mentioned before the lack of SI traceable isotope reference materials. So the central point is where's the problem to achieve SI traceability for isotope ratios? There's one effect that breaks the traceability chain for measurements with ICP systems. That is the so-called mass bias effect, shown here as a function of the atomic mass um, for the stable isotopes that will be covered in our project. Mass bias means that the detection efficiency in the, um, in the mass spectrometry system is not the same, for example, for lithium-6 and lithium-7 or for uh, bore-10 and bore-11. So how is the lack of the SI traceable, traceability handled up to now? Um, the first step is what we need. The first step is that we need a common basis of understanding. As a coordinator of the project, I learned that the CCRI and CCQM communities do not always have the same understanding for use uh, or use the same language, even for the root of the metrology traceability. Therefore, let us have a look into the international vocabulary of metrology and here to the definition of a primal measurement standard. It is either um, a measurement standard established using a primary reference measurement procedure as defined in this point 2.8 point or created as an artifact chosen by convention. In radionuclide metrology, we are using only the first choice. This is the primary reference measurement procedure. In most cases, these are counting methods traceable to the SI system. In metrology for chemistry, the second choice using artifacts is a common way with an established traceability chain to, to those uh, artifacts. And let us have a closer look to this kind of artifacts. This UPAC technical report from 2014 summarizes the status of available isotopic reference materials, about 150s, as uh, primary and secondary standards for more than 25 um, chemical elements. As an example from this report, I choose lithium and will show it to you. For lithium, the NIST material RM8545 is by convention the artifact that is regarded as a primary measurement standard. As one consequence, the uncertainty of the isotopic ratio and of lithium and lithium-6 and lithium-7 is zero, as shown here. Other materials are also reported with differences in the isotopic ratios compared with the primary standard and the associated uncertainties, which you can see here. And these small uncertainties are the challenge when thinking about a change from the primary standard as an artifact with zero uncertainty to a SI traceable measurement method with uncertainties in the same order or better smaller 
than the uncertainties in this table. And uh, in this paper published in 2016, it is demonstrated that using the isotope dilution mass spectrometry method, in this case for magnesium, it is possible to realize such small uncertainties using a primary measurement method. And you see the uncertainties here smaller than 0.1% and zero, uh, smaller than 0.1.5 per mil. Sorry, this is not percent, this is per mil. And this isotope dilution mass spectrometry will be the way how we will establish the SI traceability for isotope reference materials for stable isotope ratios in our project. So based on the SI traceability measurement method, we will develop um, analytic separation methods for high precision analysis and we will have evaluated instrumental um, mass fractionation for ICP-based mass spectrometers. In addition, we will have available MUN certified uh, seawater reference materials for stable inorganic pollutants elements. To summarize the goals of our project, the result of our proposed work will generate the following impact. We will establish a link between radiometric techniques and mass spectrometry, bridging the gap between the activity, the becquerel and the amount of substance mole of an isotope. We will close the traceability gap for isotope ratio measurement resulting from isotopic fractionation or mass bias by applying the isotope dilution mass spectrometry method. We will have a guide on the use of mass spectrometry for low level radionuclide detection and a report of different instruments, advantages and limitation uh, that will help laboratories measuring environmental pollutants to select the best suited mass spectrometry system for their work. We will have three SI traceable reference materials and an established SI traceable calibration chain for single collector ICPMS. And all mentioned points are parts of the harmonized methods for measurements of polluting elements using mass spectrometric techniques. I have already introduced the 22 partners of our project at this point and, and at this point I would like to highlight the work package leaders who are playing an essential part in the management of such a large project. The work package leaders are Ben Russell from NPL for work package one, Thea Sulani uh, from Joseph Stefan Institute for work package two, Valerie Laurenko from CA for work package three, Bitul Ari from Tubitak Ume for work package four, Saim Jerome from the Norwegian University of Life Science for work package five, and myself from PDB and for work package six, including the coordination of the project. And last but not least, some key, effect, uh, key facts. The 22 partners will contribute with in total 320 months of work to this project. And therefore we will receive, hopefully if the contracts are signed, the funding from the European Union uh, with an amount of 2.7 million euro. And as a contact address, uh, you can find my email address. That means if uh, stakeholders, uh, users um, or the manufacturers of systems, um, use end users which measure uh, environmental pollutants, which might be have interest to our work and to our project can contact me. And that brings me to the end. And uh, thank you very much for your attention. And I'm looking now forward to answer your questions.